Okay, in this lesson, we're going to look at something called confidence intervals. In previous lessons, we looked at uh, normal distribution curves as well as z-scores and how that applies to problems. Uh, this is kind of a unique section, uh, but related to statistics. So first of all, just looking at the key ideas for confidence intervals as well as just basically how surveys are, are used and why they're useful. Um, first of all, the key idea is this, is that it's often impractical, if not impossible, to obtain data for a whole population. So if I wanted to find out what type of toothpaste, for example, every single person in my town of 25,000 people used, that would take a very long time and be very impractical and, and not very useful. So uh, this next sentence is this, that instead, random samples of the population can be taken and the mean and standard deviation of the data are determined. This information is then used to make predictions about the population. So as probably you know, often random samples are taken to make predictions about an entire population. So if I took uh, 200 people and surveyed them on the type of toothpaste that they used, I can make predictions about the larger population. However, there'd probably be some error in my survey because it doesn't necessarily represent the population 100% accurately, but somewhat accurately. And that's what this section is about, is about those errors. Um, so when data approximates a normal distribution, a confidence interval indicates the range in which the mean of any sample of data of a given size would be expected to lie with a stated level of confidence. So essentially saying what I've just said is that we can be somewhat confident of our results, but not perfectly confident. And we're going to look at the different definitions and different ideas around um, that interval called the confidence interval. So here's four definitions that will be practically laid out in the next example. Uh, margin of error is the difference between the mean of the value you're determining and the true value. So basically, how close do I think I am to the true value and within what error? So it's often stated as something like plus or minus 3%. It could be plus or minus 5%, etc. But that's kind of an example. And we'll see in an example we get into that you, there's some numbers written there. Um, the confidence interval is the interval within which you are confident of the results. So it's often stated like something like this, 20 plus or minus 3%. That would be a confidence interval or between 17 and 23 percent would be a confidence interval. Uh, the range is the difference between the highest and lowest value in the confidence interval. So if my confidence interval was between 17 and 23 percent, the range would be 6 percent because that's the difference here. Or in other words, it's going to be twice your margin of error, 2 times 3. You'll see that in a, in a second in an practical light. Uh, and the confidence level is the likelihood that the results for the true population or the whole population lies in the confidence interval. So basically, how confident are you in your results? Uh, it's often quite quite confident. Uh, it's often stated something like 95% or 90%, etc. That's a confidence level. What we're going to do is skip the next part and come back to it. So we'll go to the examples. If you go to part C, some of you may have a study guide. If not... Uh, just pay attention and pause this whenever you'd like. Here's the first example about how surveys are useful and how it relates to all these definitions. This problem here says, a telephone survey of 600 randomly selected people was conducted in an urban area. The survey determined that 76% of people between the ages of 18 to 34 years of age have a social networking account. So Facebook, uh, Twitter, whatever it happens to be, 76% of 18 to 34 year olds have a social networking account. This is out of 600 people. Uh, the results are accurate within plus or minus four percentage points. So that's kind of where they think, uh, so 76% of people, but we might be a little bit off. So plus or minus four percentage points and we're in we are confident 19 times out of 20. So let's look at these definitions and how it applies to this problem. Uh, what's the margin of error? Well, the margin of error says, okay, well, we are confident, or 76% or of people, let's just maybe use a number line here, 76% of people have social networking uh, <clears throat> social networking accounts. Now, they are only confident within plus or minus four percentage points. So the margin of error could be, we could add four percentage points, or we could subtract four percentage points. So our mar margin of error is exactly that. It's plus or minus four percent. So they think they're within 76, within four percent of 76, for sure. Uh, the confidence interval would be, <clears throat> I can show you the numbers here on the number line. Well, it's definitely between 80 percent, that's the top part of the confidence interval, and 72 percent, because that's 76 plus four and 76 minus four. There's two ways you could write this confidence interval. One would be that it's 76 plus or minus 4%. That's the interval within which we are confident. Or you could state it like I have the numbers there, 72% to 80%. Okay. 
the next question, what is the range for the confidence interval of the data? Well, the range basically is saying, what's the difference between the highest and lowest value? Your range would be 8%. That's your difference between the highest and lowest value. So the range within your confidence is 8%. Lastly, what is the confidence level? So how confident are you? So essentially, that's from this sentence here. It says, we are confident that that will be true 19 times out of 20. So the way that we'd write that, so 19 out of 20, we want to change that into a percent. So if we divide 19 by 20, we'd get 0 0.95, which is equivalent to 95%. So the confidence level here is 95%. Now we're going to make predictions based on the entire population. Since this was a survey of 600 people, we can now make predictions on a larger population. So this one says here, or part E says, if the total population of 18 to 34 year olds is 92,500, what range of people would you expect to have a social networking account? So we'd expect between 72 it's given our margin of error, between 72% and 80% of people to have social networking uh, accounts. So we have to apply that. So it's going to be uh, between 72% and 80%. <clears throat> so in order to do that, we need to find out what is 72% of the population and also what is 80% of the population. And to do that, this would be 0 0.72 times 92,500. That will give you the number of people. That's 72% of 92,500. That would be 66,600. That would be the lower end of the people who would have social networking accounts. And the upper end of people who would have social networking accounts based on our survey would be 80% of them. And that would be 74,000 people. So in answer to this question, this question says, <clears throat> uh, what range of people would you expect to have a social networking account? I would say that it's between those two amounts. So between 66,600 people and 74,000. Okay, uh, let's look at one last example and then we'll uh, stop at that point and look at uh, some practical applications. Number two says this, the results of three different polls taken during the first week of November 2010 are shown on the next page. The results of each poll are considered accurate 19 times out of 20. So there's three different types of polls that we have here in Canada called the ECOS, the NANOS, and the IPSOS uh, polls. And you can see that the sample sizes were different. So for the ECOS, they surveyed 1,815 people, and their margin of error is two point, plus or minus 2.3%. In the NANOS, they surveyed less people, and their margin of error is greater. So they're, um, they're more likely to be further from the mean, in this case, as far as what they're uh, surveying. In the Ipsos, they've surveyed 1,000 people. That's in the middle, and their margin of error is essentially in the middle. So if I was to look at... Uh, the ECOS, for example, and if I was asking the ECOS, let's look at the Conservatives, <clears throat> what percent is are the Conservatives going to get as far as uh, the vote? Well, they, they're predicting 29%, but that's plus or minus 2.3%, so plus 2.3 or minus 2.3. So they would predict that it's somewhere between 31.3% <clears throat> and 26.7%. So they would predict that uh, the Conservatives will get between 26.7 and 31.3% of the votes based on what they have. Um, so let's look at something. It's essentially saying, how does the sample size, so A is asking this, how does the sample size, so these numbers here, affect the margin of error? So what you'll notice is the greatest sample size has the smallest margin of error, and the smallest sample size has the largest margin of error. So this should make sense to you. If I survey more people or use a larger sample size, then I'm less likely to make mistakes, or I'm more likely to be close to the mean and close to the at, close to the true population. So the margin of error is least when I have the biggest sample size. So sample size. So if the sample size goes up, the margin of error will go down, and vice versa. If the sample size goes down, the margin of error will go up. <clears throat> Do you expect this is usually the case? My answer is yes. 
It's usually going to be the case when I survey more people, I'm more I have a smaller margin of error, I'm going to be closer to the true population. And B, how does sample size affect the confidence interval in the results? Well, the confidence interval is this spread right here. So the confidence interval is smaller if I, sur if I survey more people. So the confidence interval interview, so if the sample size goes up, the confidence interval so anyways, I'm, I'm closer to the true population, so my confidence interval goes down because I'm closer. My margin of error is smaller, so my confidence interval is smaller. Uh, so let's just summarize kind of that big idea, <clears throat> and we'll save the other problems for the next lesson. Uh, part D says, how, how are margin of error, confidence level, and sample size related? So here's what we've just learned. If sample size goes up, your confidence level... <clears throat> Oh, your confidence level will go up because you're going to be more confident of your results and your margin of error will go down. You're less likely to make mistakes based on having a larger sample size. Uh, and the next problem would say if the sample size goes down, you would be less confident of your results. Your confidence level will go down and your margin of error would go up because you have, you're more likely to make mistakes based on the true population.